Come in, Ocean Sailor. Come in, Ocean Sailor. The Ocean Sailor Podcast. Brought to you by Ocean Sailor Magazine and Kraken Yachts. So, welcome to Ocean Sailor Podcast. Do you know this is episode seven already with myself, Dick Durham, and from him, Dick Beaumont. Hello, Dick. <laughs> yeah, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the podcast. Today, uh, we're going to be talking to a couple who took their children away for extended cruising. Well, yeah, I think we've got a very interesting one here, uh, Dick, because it's not that unusual for people to sail off with their kids for a year or two. But what Jamie and Bian uh, of Totem did is they sailed off for a year or two, and that turned into three or four and five or six, and uh, actually right through their children's uh, childhood. And even today, they have their 17 and 19-year-old daughters on their, on Totem as crew. Um, so we... It should be very interesting for people. There'll be a million and one questions we've got to try and get in. Yes, and I'm sure it'll uh, uh, invite a million and one answers, uh, <laughs> we, although we haven't got time for all of that, of course. But uh, hopefully we can get the most important ones out there for people to listen to. Of course, I know they they went to Australia, did they not, with their three children uh, and and put them in school there for a while. So, so they went back to conventional schooling for a while. And then after that, of course, they went up to Papua New Guinea, which remarkable place to take children I would have thought better than any atlas in a classroom well <laughs> well Dick as you know I sailed through uh, Papua New Guinea myself and uh, I haven't met well I haven't met anybody else that sailed through Papua New Guinea actually um, to have sailed through it with three children uh, on board young children on board I think was an amazing uh, feat yes indeed uh, let's face it not many couples have braved the ocean wave with their children uh, or even themselves, they've been a long way uh, and they've got a lot to tell us. Yeah, so I think, Dick, this is going to be an extremely interesting uh, podcast with Jamie and Bian. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's get them on, eh? Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that. Well, welcome, uh, Bian and Jamie uh, Gifford, aboard your yacht Totem. Uh, welcome to the Ocean Sailor podcast. Yeah, and uh, thanks very much from me too. I really appreciate the time and uh, the link because uh, I think you're in Mexico at the moment and uh, Dick and I are in uh, not-so-sunny UK. <laughs> That's very <laughs> true. So, Bian and Jamie, you educated your three children on board in your voyaging and I'd be good to start with just asking you how many miles you've done on the boat. Sure. Well, and first, just thank you so much for having us here. We're, we're really happy to. We're joining you from Mexico. Um, from what Jamie calls the flattest anchorage ever. We're actually uh, sitting in Totem's main cabin in a shipyard in Puerto Penasco, uh, <laughs> far north end of the Sea of Cortez. But yeah, miles. So mm. there's two versions of miles, but the one that I think uh, you probably want is what we've done as a family together since leaving Puget Sound back in 2008. I think we're about 64,423 approximately. Maybe really? 23 and a half. I'd have to look it up. Right. Oh, brilliant. Mm. And and that's all uh, five of you. That's yeah, right. It, um, except actually, for maybe the last maybe 1,500 miles or so when our son yeah. has been off to university. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, yeah. what, a, what an education into sailing those children have got, eh? It's a fantastic thing that you've done with them. Lucky Very, kids. Uh, lucky us. Yeah lucky, yeah, lucky kids. What a childhood, you know. I must, uh, I must confess I spent a great deal of my time uh, messing around on the boats, but not not covering the kind of distances they have. So that's a, a fantastic thing for them. Yes, it's a, it's kind of an international um, Arthur Ransom, isn't it? You know, secret water and swallows and Amazons and, and all that. Well, if you're aware of him yes. in America, Pat. Swallows yes. and Amazons. Oh, yes. yeah. Go yes. with go with go with Huckleberry Finn. Dick. Yes, we were on home ground. Well, <laughs> yeah. and a, a much greater writer. That's the dead sir, or a much better written book. Um, actually, talking of. Huckleberry Finn, have they read that on board, I wonder? They have, actually. They, um, Jamie read it with them when we were in Australia. I think it was. You were uh -huh. homeschooling them in Sydney while I was working. Um, we spent, the, the one time we really parked for a while before COVID was in Australia because we were about two, two and a half years in when our funds were running out. And our choices were to head home, uh, declare victory on a you know three-year sabbatical of cruising, or find a place to stop and work. And I had a work opportunity in Australia, and the complication there with schooling the kids was that 
uh, we thought it'd be really, really cool actually for them to have a, uh, an experience of truly integrating into a country, going to schools, having local friends, and Australia would be an easy way to do that. Um, except in New South Wales, uh, we could not access the public school system as locals despite having a work visa. So yeah, Jamie was owning homeschooling entirely then while I worked, and Huckleberry Finn was one of those Americana books that we started actually thinking consciously about how do we make sure our kids have American cultural context sprinkled oh, in yeah. throughout their education. I was wanting to ask you about that. Were there any complications with you taking your kids out of school in America and, and sailing off? Putting aside um, criticisms and viewpoints that no doubt you must have uh, um, had the opportunity to hear on many occasions. But, but from, a, for, uh, you know, from a governmental position, were there any issues that you needed to deal with there? There really weren't in the U.S. It's it had been normalized uh, over the maybe the last decade or decade and a half in the U.S. where more and more people were homeschooling for different reasons, many different reasons, um, not so often for the reason of going off on a boat to go sail around the world, but uh, there really there was a very low burden, and we know it's very different in other countries. Yeah, it surprised me. I did a little bit of research and f- and found that. The British government is also amazingly accommodating from uh, from that point of view, and doesn't uh, and seems well accepts homeschooling is a, a legitimate uh, strategy for educating your kids, and uh, you know at least you had, don't have that battle um, before you know making the decision. Another way of getting class sizes down. Yeah. <laughs> Some European countries really do have a have a tough time with that. Um, and in Scandinavia, I know, I think Sweden, um, you, it's very difficult to get permission. Um, our son's first girlfriend was a Swedish boat kid, and her family was on a one-year sabbatical um, on their boat, and it was a big deal to get permission to be uh, to have their high school yeah. age kids out of school for that year. Mm, well, that's interesting. interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, very different there than in Scandinavia than it is uh, in other parts of the less liberated West, I suppose you might say. Germany's, <laughs> Germany's the same. Also difficult. Uh, very Is hard. It? Yep. Right. Yeah. Was it difficult to, to get the kids generally into schools in uh, Australia? Sure. So in Sydney, uh, when we realized we, weren't, we, uh, we wouldn't be able to access uh, schools as if we were local residents, um, you pay a, a significant premium to access them on a, uh, as, a, as a non-resident. Um, but Australia, like the U.S., regulates a lot of things by state, and education is one of them. And in New South Wales, where Sydney is, um, it, while it was extremely difficult, prohibitively expensive, essentially, to like, access public I think it was around $12,000 per child per year yep. for us to put them in school. So that wasn't going to happen. Wow. Um, but in Queensland, to the north, we could access schools for them as if we, with a business-sponsored work visa, as if we were Australians. And then it comes much more affordable. It's just, you know, a thousand or so a year for books and uniforms and things like that. Um, so I changed jobs and we moved to Queensland and uh, spent right, about right. six months at the dock in Brisbane. And the kids went to school there and got to uh, learn new words and gain an accent for a little while. And wear uniforms That's for the first time. Which they had is... to wear <laughs> shoes and socks. It was absolutely <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Yeah, I bet, I bet that was, uh, yeah. you know, going from, which they presumably are most of the time barefooted, into prizing their feet into uh, into very tight um, new shoes, probably. Yeah. Uh, that must that must have been a very dreadful experience Yeah, submitting them. to I the think, tyranny of the sock is I a terrible thing. I think Niall thing. ended up in detention <laughs> several times because he wore the wrong jumper on a Tuesday <laughs> or a Friday. Right, and, it's just... <laughs> and we chuckled. It didn't matter to us, but um, yeah. they seemed to get worked up about it. And it was a great way for us to just uh, just to benchmark where the kids are and how they're doing. Can they adapt back into a more mainstream setting? And they did mm. fine. They had some challenges, mm-hmm. but mostly fine. And it was also a way to say, what do you guys want to do from here? Because they're crew members. They get a say in what we're doing. And and they were all like, oh, let's go back cruising again yeah. because it's a much better well, life. This, this was brilliant, actually. This was the unintended and truly great benefit of stopping for that year and a half in Australia and having them slide into mainstream life, relatively speaking, for a while. Because uh, we really thought that it would just be, you know, when we departed there, we'd, we'd finish a lap of the Pacific with a couple more years of cruising from what we'd saved in Australia. And instead, because they had that taste of mainstream life again before they were really clamoring for it, 
they had a chance to fully appreciate the benefits of being a cruising kid. Um, and then right. given the opportunity to choose which one they wanted, um, we're excited to go back to being cruising kids because that was a very big decision point for us. Mm. It meant that we were continuing west on an open-ended adventure as opposed to circling back around and looping to our home port. How old were they at the, at that point when they um, were empowered to make a decision that would <laughs> think obviously it was massively affect you? Eight, ten, and 13. Yeah, and you gave them that, you, you had that discussion at kind of at the end of or after some time of them, as you say, experiencing the brutality of life on shore. That's right. And for us, I think Bean and I both were in the same place on we really preferred life on the boat and and living with one foot on the boat and one foot on land trying to earn some money was difficult. It was very tough and challenging. We preferred the the cruising lifestyle, but it was important that the kids had buy in too and hmm. they could have shut it down for us, but they they were full into uh carrying on. Had you had you gone to Australia specifically um, because you knew there was an opportunity for them to go into schooling? Was that part of the plan? It was purely for work. It was the work opportunity. That was the driving reason oh. to be there, to earn money um, in, and continue our cruising experience and with one foot on shore um, as opposed to going back home. And, Bian, you said earlier that it was good for you to have got them into mainstream schooling again ashore because then you knew that their hearts were set on continuing to cruise. You said before that there they had been a period where they were, did, I think I got you, heard you right, that they were clamouring to go back ashore. Was that right? No, they actually weren't. And, and that's where we were so fortunate. Um, they weren't, but right. we fully expected that, and I think it would have happened, and that's why this timing was so good. Most cruising right. kids reach a point where they sort of think, well, wait a minute, what am I missing? Because they, like our kids experience American culture through media and there's, you know, rites of passage with age and um, I want to be normal like those kids, especially I think as they get into their teen years and are seeing themselves not as um, attachments to a family, but as independent, you know, independently operating humans making their own life decisions. And right. I, I remember now nip that off <laughs> now school in, in, uh, in Brisbane. And I think he was in eighth grade. Uh, and they put him uh, in this class, and, and one of his assignments was doing a paper on Miley Cyrus. And he's like, who, who is that? I've never heard of this person. No idea. His school is very disappointing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even I'm not sure, sure who that is. Is it a pop singer? Pop star. Yeah. yeah. But as, right, okay. as a teenager yeah. at the time, everybody would have known who a, that a was. A fabricated pop star. Right. But, yeah. Right. right. Everybody <laughs> in Australia. She is American pop star, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, right. oh <laughs> shows what I know then, does it? Yeah. <laughs> so, did you find that because there's a fair spread between the, your children's age? Did you find that they all came to the same experience? You know, so you know the things that one ran into was, was repeated in the others. Were, was it unanimous their decision or? The decision was unanimous, but it was hardest for our youngest to leave because she had made some close friends and she's our social one. So she was about eight at the time. And that was that was harder for her to say goodbye and to go off into the unknown of when am I going to have other, you know, another good uh, group of friends again. Yeah, there and are, it was it was a while there. And kids are all independent and different. And so they all they all had different reasons for what we were doing. Our son was super keen into World War II history, and we were going up through Papua New Guinea, and and uh, and there's lots mm -hmm. of um, World War II junk lying around mm -hmm. on on random beaches and coral reefs, and mm -hmm. so he got to experience these things firsthand, and for him that was heaven. Um, so they they all took it differently. And Siobhan is the youngest, is she? That's right. Those children that she was at school with, are she are they kind of pen friends, or do they still still in touch now, or or she's moved on and met met other friends, I guess. So they were for a while. Um, and I know now there's still, she's still, um, she's got her best friend from then. They follow each other on Instagram. Oh, right. Okay. Well, that's, yeah, of course. And, and one other question. <laughs> pen friends. Like, who the hell? Where, did the, where do I think I am? Yeah. <laughs> pen friends. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that is actually, it's really quite funny when you think about it. <laughs> I, I do my very best to keep out of as much social media as I can. But uh, the kids, you know, it's in their veins, isn't it? You know. Yeah. But one other thing, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is, 
did the uh, did the kids experience, were they ostracised at all by Australian children who saw them as odd or different or you know because kids can be <laughs> very very hard can't right. they? They can, I think, in particular Australia. Well, really anywhere, they can be very tough on on outsider kids, mm-hmm. and um, and we actually had to talk with them. It's uh, you know, you weren't mates with these guys growing up, and so you may not, you, you may struggle to find new friends. And and I think they they generally did okay enough. Um, but what was helpful is that we lived on Totem in a marina, and next to us was another boat that we'd crossed the Pacific with. A, um, a South African French, French, South French African family. family that had three kids similar ages to mm-hmm. ours going to the same schools. So, um, so they, oh, they they had their own peers that they brought with them into these schools, which was mm-hmm. a helpful uh, mm-hmm. helpful way to overcome that. And did it work? I wonder if it worked the other way around. I mean, some of the Australian children did they must have been curious. I mean, come home for tea. A board totem, did that sort of happen, or did they think, cracky, why aren't I on a yacht? Yeah, it, it, it happened a few times, um, but kids seemed to have other interests, and um, every once in a while there would be one that would kind of wake up and say, wait a minute, y- you sailed here on a on a boat? Who, who <laughs> right. does that? But mostly they weren't, it, it didn't seem like they were interested, which is fine. And you said that um, it, it was helpful because you were able to evaluate um, how they were doing educationally and presumably in maturity and the gregariousness uh, that, that kids exhibit. And, and how, how did you find that comparison? I, I think in many ways they, well, in some ways they were um, quite far ahead. In other ways they were a little bit behind. In, in particular math, they were slightly behind because they all hate math. <laughs> and and we said, don't worry, there's time, we'll, we'll get there. And... <laughs> Funny story. One of our uh, one of our children, who'll be nameless here, um, uh, might have not been so good at spelling, and and it didn't matter to us as long as she could read and r- learn to write and enjoy writing, and spelling would come. But in in the classroom, there was two spelling tests a week, and she was getting maybe four right out of twelve or fifteen words or something. And this is like third or year three, year four, whatever it is. And the teacher pulled me aside at one point and said, you know, she might have to go into some special class because she's not doing very well in here. And and I assured him that, honestly, we didn't really care about this, that she was going to do fine. But I said, we'll make an effort. So <clears throat> we spent a little extra time, and she got up to where she could just barely get by and not need the extra attention. Um, but we reassured our daughter that this was not a problem for us. She was going to be fine. So after we got going cruising again and we're out, um, all of the kids got into reading and then they developed this this book. They were writing a book together and they would write literally 100 pages in this made up mm-hmm. fantasy world of book. And during the mm-hmm. process of writing this, characters develop stories, like really them. rich, good stuff. Mm-hmm. But her spelling Excellent. improved dramatically from mm-hmm. the beginning to the end of this book. We never graded it it wasn't criticizing it it was just let them run with it let them have fun and develop that um that joy of writing because it's in, because it's there rather than somebody saying well your sentence structure was wrong your spelling was off mm-hmm. how interesting is that that's amazing i find that personally very interesting and did, did the book reach the uh, conclusion and, and are you going to publish it <laughs> no a, a, a domestic uh, <clears throat> uh domestic reading only we we yeah, talked right. about they talked about playing <laughs> cool. around with it more, but um, but they they wanted to keep it as a fun thing between them. Okay, no, oh, that's perhaps nice. Gets, perhaps gets gets pulled out at a wedding event in the future. <laughs> yes. yeah. oh, it passed around the crowd, you know, yeah. just to embarrass them properly. That's yeah, it. brilliant. <laughs> yeah, we've done all of that stuff. It really confirmed yeah, for us though and, what a great option homeschooling is. How much you can. Um, adapt to where your kids are, let them follow their interests in order to reach learning goals, educational milestones. And you don't have to do it by crushing their spirit with tests on things that they're not really ready for yet at the same time. Well, I mean, I, I think Dick Dick's daughter, Laura, is a, is a teacher and a very good one, uh, and, and teaching math is a difficult subject. But I'm, I mean, Dick will tell you, of course, but I'm sure she would agree. My wife's actually a teaching assistant, and she's always telling me that these children very young children, uh, uh, sitting so many tests 
that it's it's just a burden, and many of them just cannot they collapse. They can't keep up. What a waste so of time. Her job is to. It is crazy. You know, she said there's nothing wrong with them, but I've spent all my time teaching them how to read when they should be able to do this already. It's a system that anyway, sorry. that sets up to tell you what you do wrong, and doesn't really encourage you to do right. well based on individuality. It's honestly, it's tough for society to educate so many kids. It's a huge burden to do that well, but. Um, but that individuality gets gets pulled out of people because because they fail at a spelling test or they fail at this thing when they may be brilliant at something else or br- brilliant yes. at these things down the line. It just takes time to develop this. Yeah, I, I was um, intrigued in, in thinking about the uh, the issue of you know as I said earlier you know the spread of the spread of the ages. Um, you know, it's over a five-year period, so there's a, a different requirement for teaching, uh, you know, for Nile than obviously there was for Siobhan. But as the kids got older and they get to what, what I think you guys call high school grade, um, the teaching gets well. Certainly, the the as Dick has said, my daughter's a, a maths teacher, and she predominantly teaches uh, um, G- GCSEs, O-levels as we used to call them, and A-levels. And some of the stuff, uh, maths was always my favourite subject, or the, actually not my favourite, but was I was best at. Um, and I looked at some of the stuff that she's now teaching the kids, and it leaves me for dead. How did you keep in front of their requirements? Because obviously if, if you're their teacher, you've got to know more than they did. Yeah, no, it's How true. How did you manage that? So requirements in the U.S., um, the, the big end game, presumably, is to move on to higher education. Um, and we don't have something like A-levels. We sort of do. Uh, and the SAT, Standard Achievement Test, I think, or Standardized mm. Achievement Test. And But more and more colleges um, in the U.S., colleges and universities, take applications without standardized tests because standardized tests are think rightly being seen as having biases that favor adva- already advantaged students. Um, and that instead evaluations are done more on um, on an application that includes the questions that the applicants are going to answer, the short essays and their, an- their responses. Um, and of course their transcripts. And looking at that to make sort of a whole kid as opposed to an exam. Um, And what that means for us is the way that we were educating our kids plays in really well to reaching that uh, that next goal of moving on to higher education, because we allow our kids to retain a love of learning by helping them pursue the things that they're interested in. So back to that World War Two example Um, and the fact that every island was in Papua New Guinea seemed to have something, whether it was, uh, you know, a fuselage in a couple of meters of water offshore or a propeller that was the centerpiece of a village, whatever. There was, World War II was everywhere. They, it was in mm. people's faces, in their racial makeup, you know? Um, and so our son became so interested in that and really pursued it and went to incredible lengths with his reading, actually engaging with academics and forums online to learn more. Oh, it really? was tremendous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, does does that, you know, fuel his passion today? No, not really. I mean, he's a very much a student of history and language, but... Um, but it helped shape him as a as a learner, um, a lifelong learner, and someone who became articulate in um, being able to talk about a position. And it made him really different. And these things now are what are facilitating admission into higher levels of academia in the U.S., as opposed to, did you tick all the right boxes so that you can do well enough on that test so that when we line you up against all the other kids who've been also wasting time on tests, we see where you shake out and can think about what you do, which is a terrible way to evaluate mm. a kid. Yeah. Mm, mm. As the as the kids became, uh, you know, got got into being teenagers, um, they were more taking charge of their own education and their own investigations. Is that how it worked? Yeah, as they were smaller, we were much more had to be much more hands on with them. And the older they get, the more our job was about. Um, interesting environments (laughs) directing and guiding but of course they still need to learn fundamentals and so it was for us um uh, putting the resources there for for math for reading for writing core principles and then and then building on that especially around trying to incorporate the places that we were travel is this amazing educational opportunity on so many levels whether it's this love of um 
geography, history, culture, food, uh, uh, animal world, natural world, whatever it is, there's so many different slices you can take out of it. And so we would do that with the kids with their individual interests of history for one. Um, other ones were, were artistic and, and culture uh, focus. And of course, you started out um, with the children all what we call in the UK primary school age, um, uh, below the sort of 11 when they go to the senior school in the UK. And and you'd started out with the thought that you were going away for two or three years, didn't you? That's right. Uh, we thought three to five years, but we had no idea. <clears throat> Basically, we expected that... Um, we, we expected that we had enough money for that time, for that period, and we expected that our oldest would want to go to regular high school and go to the prom and take lots of tests. So it that, turns out he had no interest in any of that. And, but we you know, it turns out a natural ending around the time our funds ran out. Yeah, and it turns out we ran out of money sooner than that because we had a house that we wanted to sell before we went cruising, but the global financial crisis of 2008 and the crash of the housing market in the U.S. at that time made it so that we couldn't sell our house. And so we mm. ran out of money and ended up in Australia and all of all of that part of the story. Yeah, and I mean, Australia, because <laughs> I sailed to Australia as well, uh, actually down the same coast uh, particularly that you did. And uh, I, I got there, I couldn't get my breath about how expensive it was. Oh, you know, very and, expensive, and, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, unbelievable. I mean, I was talking, I went into, and you'll, you'll know this, and Elsies that are listening will perhaps take it for granted, but I went into what I thought were quite nice restaurants, but there's no waiters. And I got chatting to a guy um, in uh, Brisbane uh, who ran a restaurant, and uh, I said to him, I don't get any of this. This is kind of, it's not, you know, it's not one thing or the other. How come you've got no waiters? And it was he was telling me it was twenty five dollars an hour to take a to have a waiter, and so I imagine rocking up there, you know, you must have it, you must have been a bit surprised, especially being a bit broke when you arrived. It's mm-hmm. not fun. Is I, it? I, re- I recall we sailed in from New Caledonia to uh, Coffs Harbour, and it was a sporty passage, but it was it, but it was fun, and we we, we, we got went in to there. Celebrate. We, we, we arrived, we had $100 in our liquid bank account. And, and that 100 US, that was it. And we went to celebrate landfall we, across the Pacific Ocean. It's a big feat. And um, we went out, oh. we bought ice cream. And we each got this big cone. And oh, God, it was the best thing forever. Yeah. And then it was $28. And it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> we just spent like more than a quarter, almost a third of our total net worth right now on ice cream. Um, <laughs> We needed to make money. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you spring out to, and, and go out to New Zealand at all? We didn't. Um, so when we were in French Polynesia was when we were making the decision about where to go to be able to earn money by the end of the season. And New Zealand oh, was yeah. in the mix um, as a place that we might go. And I talked to a couple of recruiters there, but it's just that much smaller than already quite small Australia. Um, and the mm. job market wasn't as good. I had more opportunities in Sydney uh, or in Australia, and so that became the obvious choice for us. While we didn't get a chance to sail there on Totem, ironically, my job in, in Sydney, my first job in Australia, was um, working for Tourism New Zealand. Um, and because of the TNZ, um, I was helping with strategy and implementation of all of their digital marketing uh, strategies in Australia. And so I, naturally I had to sample the product and had a number of trips back to Auckland and down, some down to the South Island as well, just to, to experience New Zealand and what they were selling to Australians. So the rest of the family unfortunately didn't get to go, but yes, um, I sometimes had a little shopping list and definitely appreciated the uh, the better value on prices there. Yeah, I, 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 I must tell you, I, you know, I had, a, I had a great time in New Zealand. I, I thought, you know, there's the difference between, in particular, from a sailing point of view, mm-hmm. is in Australia, the especially on the east coast, the, the anchorages are sometimes few and far between. Um, and uh, in Australia, uh, in New Zealand, I should say, 
every time you turn around, there's some a beautiful anchorage that you can anchor in, and you go another quarter of a mile, there's another beautiful anchorage. And it was, you know, from a sailing point of view, I often wondered why Kiwis had ever left New Zealand and, and sailed somewhere else. But, uh, yeah, it was all good fun out that way. And, of course, after, after then, you started to head back towards the States, didn't you? Well, we left, we had this family meeting um, after the year and a half. We had money put away. We could support ourselves for a couple more years. And we had this family meeting to sort of decide which way do we go. And that was the decision point for the kids to say, um, um, or to chime in and say, do we want to go back to the U.S. or do we want to keep going? Yeah, so we we kept going. We went north. Uh, We went Mm -hmm. up outside the Great Barrier Reef and into Papua New Guinea for about three months. Um, So we left Australia 21st century, and we stepped back in time about a thousand years uh, in Papua New Guinea. Spectacular experience, as you know. And I think I think you mentioned earlier, Jamie, when we spoke about that, that you'd been warned in Australia about going to Papua New Guinea. Uh, and I guess when you got to the restaurants there, there weren't any waiters because they'd all been eaten. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> no waiters. <laughs> so we, we were in Australia figuring out where we wanted to go next, and Bian said, "I want to go to Papua New Guinea," and my response was, "I don't want to die." Because the <laughs> reputation is quite, um, yeah. quite one of, of yeah. volatile uh, culture. But, and I said to Bian, well, let's figure out how to make this this uh, this work if you want to try because it's family safety and all. And so she jumped into a lot of research and er- interviewed the few people that we could find that had either sailed there or traveled there, and figured out a pattern to where violence tended to happen and where none happened. And so we were able to pick a path through there because it. It then made sense. There was a uh, a predictable path. Yeah, I, I also sailed through uh, Papua New Guinea, and I think similar to yourself, I found it the most fantastic place I've ever sailed in, and and easily the most dangerous too. If you, the problem is around the cities, and the problem in the cities is alcohol uh, often, um, and they are anyway a very violent nation. I mean, there's apparently 864 languages spoken, and every village is at war with the next one. Um, and but so what I did after a time, I would only uh, stop more than 50 miles outside a big city or, or big town. Um, if I had to go into the town, I'd go right into the centre and then I'd go right out again. And that's where I had a wonderful time. And the people, you know, I'm sure you're going to tell me this. And I'd love to hear the experience of your children coming from Australia, a very organised society, straight into the massive mixing pot of, uh, of Papua New Guinea uh, children. They must. It must have been a, a a massive education for them to see two absolutely juxtaposed positions and 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 kind of societies. It was it was massive. Uh, that's actually the perfect word for it. And in taking this time out as a family to go live a life afloat to experience the world, one of our real goals with our kids was to help them appreciate that by the sheer luck of their birth, they have all of the choices in life. And um, they're just they're available for them to to make the most of and that this does not exist for so much of the world. And that is hard to have that better impressed on you than in Papua New Guinea, where they would could run and play and um, share picture books uh, on the beach with kids from the island. Um, But know that those kids are maybe not going to get beyond a very the first few years of education. They may probably won't get a chance to leave their home island other than a couple of visits and forget higher education and being able to be self-directed in a role that is um, uh, or a, a pursuit uh, that is outside the subsistence level for their family. That's their lot. And I think it, it also just shows how how easy life is when you come from a place where so much has been created for you and the availability of things. And in Papua, when you when you get there and you see a uh, a man walking up and down the beach looking for scraps of uh, fishing line that's washed up so that then he can braid these scraps together to make a rope to keep the mast up in his dugout canoe. And then they go out in the canoe and you're constantly bailing. You know, little things that we just take for granted. We have an uh, inflatable dinghy. There's, water doesn't come in and we zip along. 
for them, it's a paddle and, and bailing. And You always have at least one extra person constantly bailing, right? Remarkable. If There, if you didn't catch it, make it, or or, uh, or grow it, you didn't have it. Well, and, you traded, maybe, you, you know? So we were when we came in, we were like... Uh, it was like the tinker showing up with all of these all of these great possibilities and boats line up to uh, to trade with you. We were tipped off to this in our research in advance, talking to cruisers in Australia who'd been through Papua New Guinea before about what kind of trade items to bring, what people would be interested in, um, and and it was fascinating to see how in an archipelago, the Louisiades, where cash economy truly doesn't exist, this trading is so critical to be able to get mm. basic supplies. And did the did did your children make friends there? I mean, were they able to talk to the their contemporaries there, or the littlest or, or, kids or communicate? The littlest kids didn't speak any English. They start learning it in school. Uh, the littlest kids are speaking a local language um, and our local dialect. We did learn uh, a number of words in uh, in the Misima dialect. That is actually thankfully because yes, eight hundred plus uh, unique, mutually unintelligible languages in Papua New Guinea. But there's sort of a trade language among the Louisiana archipelago, this Misima dialect that, that everyone speaks. And so we were able to travel through a number of islands using um, right. using the same, yeah. you know, t- 20 phrases and greetings. But and the, numbers. the kids oh, did make friends there, but they're not friendships that you can carry on yeah. because they have no way to communicate out from those, those no. islands. I, I, found the, I found the villages uh, outside, well, well outside, fantastically welcoming, um, you know, often had tours of the village and i imagine they must have really responded well to your your children and uh you know to have white kids going in and and seeing how they were living and and interacting with them uh, they might i bet they responded well to them didn't they mostly so i remember one time this uh this this family came out in a small dugout canoe uh and um this is in booty booty and they came aboard to trade with us, and I noticed that the child had a big infection on his leg. Um, Nasty-looking thing. And so I got a five-gallon bucket, and I filled it with some warm, clean water and dumped a bottle of betadine solution in it and put the kid in this. And the kid was not, he was like, uh, I don't know, white people, <laughs> you, you look pretty ghost-like. And little little boy he put him terrified. in, and he was terrified. He thought we were going to eat him. Felt so um, <laughs> it's sort of heartrending, right? <laughs> but, but he was really genuinely very afraid of us, and uh, right. and we're like we're just we just want to help. His leg's been mangled by this coconut crab, and we want to you know help help his mom stave off the infection that he was getting. But, but pulled out some picture books, and and after a little bit, the kid was settled and fine. Uh, but Papua, um, th- there's an island in. Uh, 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 Ninigo. Ninigo, yeah, There's, in the Bismarck Archipelago. Yeah, there are three children named after mm. members of Totem's of, crew. Yeah. Um, so oh, lovely. We have, yeah. there's a little Bian, there's a little Nile, and there's a little <laughs> yeah. and, um oh, And that's so great. We, we did make friends, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. What a lovely story. It was pretty yeah. neat. And that family we're able to keep in touch with um, because they, they leave their home island, which doesn't have roads or sewage or electricity or fresh water or anything, but they leave that and they go to the regional capital um, to work and then they come and they go back and forth. Um, right. And when they're in the regional right. capital for some whatever months, um, so, uh, about- a two a day open boat ride uh, for a hospital, right. for a shop, for anything. Yeah. When you left Brisbane um, and that you there'd been this kind of, um, you'd cross the Rubicon in many ways because you weren't too sure whether you were going to go home and it would be the children's decision. It was, we want to go back home. We've, we've had enough of all this fun stuff. Um, you'd cross the Rubicon. It was quite clear. No, they wanted to carry on. Where were you going? Where was the, Were you going to make a circumnavigation or or just go with the, whichever way the wind blew? It was really much more about the wind. At that time, we had no goals to circumnavigate. I, I think it was to go eat good food in Southeast Asia. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the next probably. goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enjoy good Thai food well, Indonesian. Yeah. It was really, I think, I would, yeah, it was experience-driven, and food would definitely be part okay. of that. Um, oh, all right. I spent a semester in college in Indonesia. My parents lived in Jakarta for eight years. Um, I speak passable Bahasa Indonesian. So for me, getting to spend a chunk of time in Indonesia was really important introduce right. it to my family um we, we didn't we didn't have the notion uh cemented of circumnavigating i i grew up with it i was inspired by robin lee graham when i was a, a kid i read dove and when i was 11 and 
that was it. That's what I wanted to do. So for me, it was always back here, but, um, but I, we didn't want to have that be our driving goal because that just seemed too much like a bucket list thing. And we wanted just right. to experience where we were. So it really yeah. wasn't part of what was driving us at that time. Yeah. Ticking I mean, a box, putting mm -hmm. a notch in, it's just not our, not our jam. Uh, well, I think, <laughs> uh, I mean, we, I'm very much in agreement with that. I think that if, if what you're trying to do is, as you've just said, guys, you know, tick the, tick the, um, take a notch off your belt and tick the book then what you're going to be needing to doing as you'll know as you'll have planned it yourself is you're you're following the weather seasons and there's a limited amount of time that you can spend in each area before you know you you run into the threshold of having to cross um, a typhoon belt or a cyclone belt and before you know where you are you're running 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 and what you see in that trip, if you're trying to do it, is a lot of sea. And guess what? The sea looks exactly the same wherever you go. It's a bit colder and a bit warmer, and it's a bit rainier, but it's the sea. And that, that to me, is a monstrous loss. I, I have never done that. I've What I've really liked to do, and it sounds awesome, you, you, you've done that too. You've gone to uh, an area, sailed, okay, had a great time in an area, then gone to somewhere else and said, right, okay, let's explore this place and go off in all the directions. And that way you also get to spend more time and slow down. So you get to know the people, don't you? You do. Uh, it's, it's, if, it's If there's anything we were, we would be ticking off its um, interpersonal experiences because of the um, awesome opportunities to learn from each other. And, uh, and those connections with people are really what mark our journey for us, I think. It's the interaction with people that really makes it so rich. I, I'm a professional sailor and sailmaker and rigger, so I've got that in my blood. But, um, and the sailing is wonderful. But it's about the places you go and the people you meet that, that totally enrich the experience. You, you, can't, you can't buy that in a book. Um, to meet no. some guy who is on an island in Papua who was a bo boy, had a little infection in his toe, and a Japanese soldier cut his toe off to save him from this infection and and here he is you know toeless guy and smiling and he's got tattoos and things and to hear his stories oh, well. and there's a million Amazing. there's so many people we've had these interactions All with right well to, to speak with yeah. the elder and uh on mall right and and who talked about effectively being owned he was owned by an australian trader who tattooed him as a mark of his ownership of this man this is this is our living history that there is effectively slavery um, that uh, doesn't it, that was not written in history books that, that I read. No, mm. I no. don't think you're going to get. I I don't believe there is a way of traveling this earth that is going to provide you with so many variable circumstances and sets of situations, but also enable you to see and meet societies and people within those societies that are completely thinking from a different direction to you and it does you good i, I you know i've seen people nailed to crosses and uh you know being sort of dragged out and beaten in well in fights in papua new guinea between villages i, I i'm going to tell you a funny one at least i hope you laugh <laughs> um i did and <laughs> I learned to, to to ask two questions everywhere I went in Papua. The first question is, are there any rascals? Correct. And the second is, are there any crocodiles? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, <laughs> and yep. uh, we between know these those questions. two, <laughs> there you go. You know, and, and, and the funny thing was, I, I wonder if you had the same experience. Because of once you start to know and you start to understand that really, really these people are at war with their next village and they really, really don't like each other, then you start to realise what's happening. Because I would always ask, as I said, once I'd got into the throw of it, um, are, are there any rascals? And the answer was nearly always, um, well, uh, there aren't uh, here. Everybody is friendly, but that village over there, oh, they're all rascals. Yes, mm -hmm. and. It, that was so then you get to that village and they're pointing in the other direction back where you came from um but i did i will tell you and i wonder if you i'm trying to think of the name of it and i can't remember it i anchored inside a volcano and i was following an american yacht 
And uh, when I say I was following him, everywhere we went, he was about two or three weeks ahead of us. And we heard this story about uh, a shooting um, aboard a yacht, but we didn't know which one and stuff. And it was hardly any boats, of course, the same. I'm sure I bet you didn't see many when you were there. No. And when uh, I dropped anchor in this bay and, and this chief came over in a canoe and welcomed us and gave us coconuts and, and all that thing. And um, I said, uh, oh, are there any rascals here? And he said, no, not not now. Um, the the American shot and killed one, and the other one uh, shot him in the leg. He's now in hospital. Uh, I thought, oh, no, I'm in dreadful trouble. So I said, oh, oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, he said, no, it's okay. They were rascals. They should be shot. <laughs> so the cruel justice of that of that society, you know, there's no well, there were literally no prisoners, um, and I, you know, I imagine, you know, of course, because we both went to uh, Papua, there's a lot of common interests we've got there. But it, I just, I think, it, you know, now I'm thinking about it more and more. It must have been so mind. It was mind blowing for me. I don't know how mind blowing it must have been for your children. It was an education that you can't, mm -hmm. well, obviously can't pay for. It's no, an incredible education. Right. Well, that was certainly a start. Uh, there's a lot more to hear from this this pair with their children sailing all that distance, don't you think, Dick? I think that's coming in the next part, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, we got uh, two parts in, in the uh, series from Totem. Um, the first one, of course, we've asked them about what they did and what motivated them, as you, as, as the listeners will have heard. But in the second part, we are kind of getting into a lot more about the whys and the wherefores and the hows uh, of how they educated the, the children on board as they as they sailed around. So it's it's yeah. uh, we got a lot to ask them in the second part, uh, I think, Dick, and it should I be think, very good I think listening. So. Yeah, I think so. It's a, it's a daunting prospect. Uh, but one done with great confidence from those two, who are clearly uh, very capable yachtsmen. So, yeah, that will be good. Yeah, it's, so, you know, Dick, that's an interesting point. Um, they, we, as we've talked to them, they haven't shown any doubt that they did the right thing, have they? That's good. They haven't. No, they haven't. They, they really, uh, they're really watertight on that, uh, and that came over very well. So... Uh, we do apologise to listeners because this podcast has been later than normal in being broadcast. And that's because, of course, you've been very busy at the yard in Turkey, Dick, I think, with the with the new K-50. Yeah, we've had uh, quite a lot of dramas because we were going to launch on the 4th of May. Um, and, <laughs> and then Turkey went into lockdown. Um, and so everything went on a stall situation for uh, three weeks. But we're now trying to catch up and get the boat uh, splashed. Actually, it's going to be next uh, Thursday, which is the 27th of oh, May. Great. So by the time people hear this podcast, probably, uh, she'll have actually, you know, been launched. But there's been yeah, a lot, great. a lot, a lot of catch-ups. And, of course, COVID is spinning its nasty web all around the world. And, unfortunately, we got caught in that in, in Turkey with this lot. But... Uh, we do expect to be able to get back to podcasts coming out every fortnight soon. And uh, as you say, Dick, apologies if uh, people have been waiting for it. We've got a lot of followers now. Uh, and we've got a lot of um, excellent photographs going into the next Ocean Sailor magazine showing the K-50 launching. And talking of COVID, of course, the other article in there <laughs> is from Kevin Ward and how he sailed away from COVID after how many days was it, yeah. Dick, in, yeah. in South well, Africa? Well, <laughs> It was just a, a bit of a lockdown. 465 days confined on their Elan 44 in uh, Cape Town. <laughs> we moan about a couple of months in the UK and uh, whether we got to do 10 days quarantine when we come back from going abroad. But uh, yeah, I think they've broken all the records to the extent, to the extent and, and their desperation of getting out <laughs> runs to the extent that they then did escape and did a 5,000-mile ocean passage <laughs> to Suriname. What about that? Yes, yeah, so they had to pass St. Helena because that was locked down. Uh, an ascension isn't ideal because the anchorages are a little bit more open, but by then they needed some fresh veg and stuff. 
So it was a hell of a trip uh, and an interesting one. They've done very well. And of course, now Kevin is planning his next stage to take her up through the Caribbean and into the intracoastal waterway behind Florida. So we'll look forward to hearing about that as well. That story features uh, in Sailor's Story in Ocean Sailor magazine this month. Um, we've got a few other bits. We've got a great article from Morgan Grace about uh, leadership, something that you and I really do understand, Dick. You can only have one skipper on a boat. No, you can't sail by committee. Someone has to be in charge, Dick. You understand that probably better than anybody. Yeah, you do. Where you get where you run into difficulties is where you get a slightly less experienced skipper with a more expen- experienced crew, and before you know where you are, you've got a, 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 a standby skipper undermining everything that the real skipper is saying. You've got to be careful of that, and you just yes. have to be strong. And you just have to spell it out sometimes. Listen, this is the way it is. So, yes. you know, I think Morgan's uh, article will give everybody a really good uh, heads up on that. And we got the third and final part of our series on piracy, which has been, I think, very useful. We know that it has because the response has been good. This is written by you, Dick, and your own long experience uh, going to many of the areas where there have been troubles. And although uh, you're explaining how to bat them off, you're also putting it in context because we don't want to scare them off either. No, uh, well, the thing is, Dick, it's true that I've been through a lot of areas that people may be uh, concerned about, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Philippines, a lot of Southeast Asia and a few other places as well, the Caribbean, and people are concerned about them. But you do have to get this in context. You know, in 40 years of blue water cruising all around the world, I've lost one thing to theft on board effectively that's called piracy, which was the spiral kill cord off of my outboard engine. So that's really, that's it. <laughs> That'll do. That'll do for me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> as you said, I think you made the point before, Dick, um, when we were when we were discussing all of this, you know, there's far greater risks uh, on the land. But, of course, people accept those risks. They're seen as something you just have to deal with. Every time you get in a car, you don't know really that you're going to get out of the car in one piece, do you? But it's a risk that no. people accept. The, the, to, to put it further in context, and I would like to, um, before we get you know, on to other things, in one week in Florida, more people are killed by road accident uh, than uh, in 20 years of piracy in the entire world. So well, like, let's are. get it right. That you know? really does put it into context, doesn't it? So, yeah, it's, it, it's the other thing that I just would like to mention. We've done a very extensive uh, walkthrough YouTube video uh, of the interior and the exterior of the new Kraken uh, 50 that's just about to launch. And that is the final stages. Um, we've done the, we decided to video the final stages of uh, the production so that people can see the boat uh, Waltz and all, you would say. You know, there's a lot of wrappings on. There's a lot of cardboard in the boat. There's workmen still on the boat. Everybody's getting on with their job. But we think it's important um, for people to see beyond the veneer um, because, really, that's it's, it's the core of the boat that's going to protect you and deliver you safely wherever you want to go in this world. And that's, of course, the entire focus of a Kraken 50. Well, that's true. And the other thing, of course, about the Kraken philosophy is that uh, it is a strong boat. It is well made. It is well laid up. And there is nothing to hide. And you can't say that from a lot of other modern production boats who would never show you what goes into and what goes down below. They will show you only the polished, finished item at the boat show. Uh, So I think it's all credit to Kraken for that. Yeah, thanks, Dick. It's, you know, we're proud of what we did, what we've done with that video. Uh, and the next one is coming out very shortly. Um, the f- response to the first video has been enormous. We had 2,000 viewings in just the first few days. Um, and clearly, people do want to know, and they should. They shouldn't just accept the, you know, the blithe words of a salesman at a boat show. They actually want to get in and under the deck and look at, look at exactly how the boat is constructed. And that way you'll know. When you sail off and the weather gets a bit heavy, you know that uh, you've got a boat that's looking after you. Well, I have to say that even all the years I've been sailing and all the boat shows I've covered, since I've got to know the Kraken, 
uh, when I go to a boat show now, uh, I, I look at them a bit differently than I used to do. Mm. Uh, and, uh, so, and I will continue to do that. So it's been a bit of an eye-opener for me as well. Well, okay, Dick, that's, uh, it's been a very interesting podcast. That's about it. I hope everybody will listen to part two, which is coming up shortly. And, uh, yeah, that's a good night from me. And I'm sure they will. Uh, and if there's anything they didn't like, and if there's we hopefully things they did like, then please email us at hello at oceansailormagazine.com. And please don't forget our other social media channels. Dick, you mentioned uh, creative directors and warts earlier on. I'm afraid nobody's managed to help me with my sign-off. Oh, so no. I'm going to just fire away with it. And it schools out. And the results are in. And they're chalked up on the blackboard of judgment. Uh, we've been told, or Dick has been told he must try harder. And I've been told it's back to the school of hard knots. Bye-bye. Oh, dear. Knots. Back to the school of hard knots. Brilliant, Dick. I'm just going to say goodnight then, please. Please, please. <laughs>